Mass murderer Brenton Tarrant will speak for himself at his sentencing next month after sacking his lawyers, raising concerns it may be difficult to control what he says in court. But a leading criminal barrister says there are tight legal constraints on what the mosque gunman can speak to at sentencing and also on his access to victim statements. In March, the 29-year-old pleaded guilty to 51 charges of murder, 40 of attempted murder and one charge under the Terrorism Suppression Act relating to the attacks at the El Noor and Linwood mosques. Marie Dyberg says it's his legal right to represent himself despite what people may think of his crimes. When somebody is represented at sentencing, they don't speak because they have counsel. In his case, of course, an intervener is not his counsel, so I can anticipate he will be allowed to speak. But a judge will be ensuring that whatever is said is within the bounds of what is appropriate for sentencing. That is an interesting scenario, isn't it? Because once someone opens their mouth and says something, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. So quite difficult to control, isn't it? You can jump pretty quickly where you can silence someone. Now, the general feeling is that sentencing is so important to anybody facing the court and access to justice that sentencing, the default position, is you are there in person. But it may be that there are different considerations here and that the sentencing may take place with the defendant remotely and, of course, in effect, being being on camera. That is something a judge may decide. The defendant will be allowed to argue against that uh, because, of course, they must have a view and the Crown will have a view as well. But that is one potential way of keeping somebody under control. It's a very big step to deny a defendant access to the public courtroom. So in the courtroom then, would you anticipate, because when lawyers make submissions at sentencing, they're standing up, they're in the body of the court, um, where would he be? One would think logistically for security reasons um, and just for any defendant, they must, of course, be with a security guard, whether they uh, pose a real problem or not, that they would set up, I would imagine, the dock where the person would have uh, the desk available, would have the microphone available, and, of course, can see and hear the judge and the Crown. Or they may have a separate uh, box set up so that he could be in the court, but he certainly uh, nobody, even lawyers, uh, certainly no one in the court is allowed to just simply walk around the court. Uh, but but he will be entitled to see and hear the judge and the Crown at all times. And victim statements. In cases like these, victims can make uh, victim impact statements to the court. Um, will he get access to that sensitive information? Yes, he will, and he must. But... Already, just in the general body of law, there are very, very strict rules around the use of victim impact statements. And how it works, just generally at the moment, um, say myself as counsel, I receive a copy um, of a victim impact statement from the Crown. I do that on the undertaking. I will not copy it. I will not give it to anyone else. I will not let anybody else look at it or be within hearing unless they are the defendant, uh, perhaps a court-appointed interpreter, perhaps, and that is all. I then either sit with the defendant, hand the victim impact statement over, the defendant reads it, I take it back, at the end of the hearing, I hand it back to the Crown and they take it back into their custody. Or I will read the victim impact statement out to the client. Sometimes clients don't want to listen, they don't want to hear, uh, but at least they've been given the opportunity. He will not um, get it directly because no defendant will receive it directly, uh, even if you are self 
represented. There are ways um, and procedures in place where they do not have that control over a victim impact statement. How does the court manage the situation whereby an individual like this may get some satisfaction or glee from involving himself in the proceedings along with victims? There are always going to be people who want to do that. There are are going to be defendants generally who want to go all the way, who want uh, people to have to re, you know, um, read statements at court that should, should be accepted as evidence. And you cannot control that because the system says you're entitled to that. There'll be a lot of logistics uh, that will need to be considered in terms of who can access the court, members of the public, because, of course, the public arena is uh, not huge in any courtroom in New Zealand, all sorts of identification, how our submissions are presented, how people are kept under control, and that's for everybody in the court, so that the decorum of the court is maintained. And there will be plans, <laughs> if I sound a bit flippant, plan A, plan B, plan C, they'll all be in place and ready to be uh, put into effect should certain things happen. It will be a very well-prepared sentencing with all potential circumstances taken into account and what the response will be. What are the options for sentencing? Because there would be, well, no case that is directly comparable and the number of people that have been killed here and obviously attempted murder, 51 murder charges, 40 attempted murder and a terrorism um, charge. What is the potential scope? Is there an upper cap on the sentence that this man could get? No. And, and there is a misconception, unfortunately, where people read in the paper that, oh, yes, that somebody's got 13 years or 15 years. When somebody's convicted of murder, they are sentenced to life imprisonment, and it means just that. You are in prison for life. Where the numbers come into play is that there is then the option of having a minimum parole sentence put in place and you cannot apply for parole before that time is up. In New Zealand, unless there are extreme circumstances and there is a lesser period of minimum non-parole, anybody convicted of murder they have a minimum non-parole of 10 years. You cannot apply for parole until your 10 years is up. And then in other circumstances, that term can be increased. So what you read when you read figures, it is to do with parole only. This person has pleaded guilty to murder, has been convicted of it a number of times, but anybody who is convicted of life imprisonment gets, sorry, murder, gets life imprisonment and it means that you can stay there for your life. Marie, in terms of managing people coming into the court, because there is a, a right to come and watch proceedings, how do you manage those coming to support the victims and perhaps those coming to support the uh, person who's being sentenced, who may I even an- sympathise with his views in yes. this case. I would anticipate that you would have the courtroom, and it may well be that those in the actual courtroom will be those who are given some sort of priority for either side. There will then be other courtrooms I can anticipate that will be set up with uh, audio-visual facilities so that members of the public or support people can be in other courtrooms. They can watch the proceedings, but they're not actually in that main courtroom. So I can anticipate that. Then whether or not there is something outside the courtroom that's set up for people to watch, that I don't know. Of course, the media will be there and they'll be able to film uh, the proceedings themselves. 
but this is a sentencing that has to go smoothly for everybody, not just the defendant himself and his supporters, if there are any, but for everybody involved. So there will be a lot of steps taken to ensure when there is a very unpopular defendant, that person exercises all the rights they're entitled to. And it's easy to say, well, they did this. They don't really deserve the weight of the law. Well, of course they do. And that was criminal lawyer Marie Dyberg.